What do you need? Do you need to shake up your practice? Is there breath sound? Is there some way that you can show up for yourself? Because that's, that's what you're looking for. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Food Matters podcast, your home for nutrition, health, and wellness education. My name is Laurentine. I am a filmmaker and a nutritionist and the founder of foodmatters.com, and I'm here to hold your hand on this journey to optimum health, transformation, and emotional healing. Hello, hello, Food Matters audience. Thanks, community. Thank you, families. Thank you for joining us here today and on another Food Matters podcast. And today we have the privilege of being joined by Ryan Haddon. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us. Oh, it's so beautiful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Yeah, so before we get started, Ryan, I just wanted to tell um, our listeners a little bit about you just so we can have a bit of a backstory before I start getting into the nitty gritty, right? <laughs> yeah. So Ryan Haddon is a certified life and spiritual coach. He's a hypnotherapist and certified meditation teacher with over 18 years experience with clients all around the world. She's also a sought after public speaker and also speaks at corporate retreats and wellness events. And Ryan also runs her own private workshops. And I am so glad that we get to chat today because I feel your story is very, in general, in a very a similar story to what most women are going through right now and the amount of pressures that we are under as women. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you first got into the work that you've you're doing now and what led that what led to it so in regards to stepping into the highlight of your lives and like all the different experiences that you went through being in hollywood to then realizing hmm there's more to life than this i'd love to know oh wow well it's all a journey right i don't think one version of it is better than another. It's all this beautiful tapestry and some moments are more difficult and some, you know, some bits of the journey are more treacherous. Um, yes, part of my story led me out into Hollywood and that world and red carpets and, you know, the, all the people, places and things and the shiny things. And those are fun and beautiful. And if you know your worth and your value, you can enjoy them. And if you don't, they're a huge pitfall. And um, as it were, my story is that I was led out there because I was in a, um, just grasping at so many things outside of myself, looking to fill this spiritual hole that I didn't know that I had. And um, it, it does, you know, Hollywood beckons. <laughs> and so I had a lot of friends out there and married into that world. And like I said, it was very fun in the beginning and it really did after a while start chipping away at my self-esteem. But I'd been on a path of spirit and looking for meaning in my life. And when I was 17, I went to India very early and lived there for a few years. So I've always been a seeker of sorts. And only recently in the last few years, I've stopped saying that I'm a seeker. I am I feel that if we're always... <laughs> Do we ever stop to be a seeker? Well, I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm also a hypnotherapist, so I'm a big believer in the subconscious and us using words, and I think they have a lot of power, and this idea of always seeking, of always looking, of always uncovering, of always and not finding. Um, and so it's just subtle. It's a subtle shift. Of course, I'm always, you know, I'm always taking classes, and I'm always improving myself, and I'm always reading. I mean, that's just who I am now. But this idea that I identify of myself as someone who's constantly seeking I feel like that I can shift that language a little bit. And so it's, it's, it's just these subtle things where we find our power and that word might empower someone else at, an, at some point in their journey. And I'm never going to stop learning. I'm always going to be excited by it. Um, so anyway, that, 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 that's just part of how it is. And I, you know, part of that seeking was looking into, you know, I used a lot of different things to try to manage big feelings. Some of those were shopping and spending and eating and 
relationships and, you know, friendships, putting everything above myself, looking for meaning, even my spirituality, I think at a time, there's a lot of spiritual ego attached to it. And, um, enter, you know, um, alcoholism and addiction of all kinds. And so that was a real leveler. And that's really what brought me to my knees. And um, from that place that I'm celebrating this year will be my 20th year of sobriety. So it's a long journey, a beautiful journey. But that's really was the, I hit the wall, if you will, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, November. And so that really um, catapulted me into building something strong and practical and real and letting go of all the things I'd been grasping at, seeking and not finding. Um, so that's it's been a beautiful, all of it. I mean, I'm 53 years old, so the whole journey is incredible, but I, I am particularly um, proud of the last 20 years and what I've built. And then in turn, how you know, a big part of the building was in giving it away getting some information, building brick by brick, and then turning around and giving it to another woman. And so service has been a big part of me actually integrating what I was learning. And so so that was very beautiful. That's a big part of how I kept my sobriety and you know, was able to work with others and just that expansion of purpose, what I've been always seeking in my 20s and early 30s not finding purpose. And again, as I said, that was just a particular uh, discomfort in my soul of not feeling aligned to purpose and not being able to find it. And then instead seeking other things, but knowing I had this huge potential, this seed of potential inside myself. Um, it was almost like this uh, sand in the oyster that was constantly irritating. And, it, and as it were, I would always surround myself by people in their excellence. So it would highlight my lack and my inability to find my own excellence. And somehow, you know, it, it was another painful experience doing that. I learned a lot from those, those incredible people and in their, you know, in their passion and their purpose or that I surrounded myself with. And um, it's just so beautiful to find purpose later in life and to appreciate it the way I do. And my path, is, again, is of service to self and others. Obviously, it's I first am in turn treating and learning and growing, and then I turn around and give that back in my practice and my workshops and things like that. Mm, oh, my gosh. Hi, Ryan, I have so many questions for you. It's so exciting to um, to be able to speak to somebody, especially, you know, a learned a learned um, spiritual, um, I would call you a spiritual oh. guru. I really love your work so much. But, you know, we, especially women, I'm in my early 40s, we go through so much, like you're saying, seeking. We go through so much anguish trying to fit in. And then when we try, we actually finally fit in, we realize, actually, no, we're not living our authentic self. And we're putting on all these masks. And then we try to put, take off all the, these masks. And then we're like, oh, we're just living from the heart now. And we're so free. And then we forget who we really are. And then we forget our purpose. And then we go back, oh, okay, where do we find our purpose again? You know, it feels like it's such a roller coaster. And, you know, you've obviously had a couple of more years of experience in this world. And I, I, would, say, I would say I'm a seeker as well. But I, I love that you're saying and you're calling me out on my words, because then we will always be seeking, right? <laughs> I just want to find it, right? <laughs> But I think it really comes down to um, realizing, okay, the, our ultimate, our mm -hmm. essence, right? Our self-worth and going back into self and really coming back to self. When was the time that you really felt like you were able to say, yes, I've come back to myself now? I love how you talked about all these versions of ourselves. And I think it just keeps evolving as we evolve alongside, you know, life keeps changing and, you know, we can either be dragged along or we can keep looking for the little shifts. There's this um, saying that pain is the touchstone of spiritual progress. And I like to think that when we start being becoming more seasoned on the path, it doesn't have to be through pain that we start shifting and changing. We start to notice little nudges, little things where we're forcing our will, where we're surrendering, where we're um, doing the footwork, but then turning over the results. And um, you know that leaning in, to ourselves instead of leaning out. I think that's when I started noticing myself doing that more and more. Um, 
I started to admire that. And that's where my self-esteem grew. I noticed where I started to trust more. I started to have faith more. I started to stop hustling. And there's a time to hustle. You know, there's a time for that. There's a time where we just do the legwork. But you know what I mean? When we're just, everything is just, has to be this way and it has to be that way. And that intransigence, when we feel that and it keeps us up at night, all those, those things is when, um, when I saw myself letting go and then seeing life sort of take off, in different places, through friendships, through relationships, through business, my business, um, where I, you know, I moved onto a farm and I just started doing what I was doing. And then, you know, I got contacted to be an in-house life coach for, you know, Courtney Kardashian was starting a new website and she wanted an in-house life coach. And I just, that's when you start to see the magic that I'm in my purpose. I'm deeply doing what I want to do. I'm doing it with purpose. I'm doing it with passion and I'm trusting. So I turned my business over. I always say God's my employer. I turn my business over. And so then things just get moved around on the board. Granted, I have incredible relationships that I've curated and cultivated over time. But um, when I started seeing that being, I started to esteem myself more and more by just moving closer to um, my relationship with self and, and the universe. You know, I know that sounds really woo, but it's, that is, I don't know how to say it any different than that. That is, was the most esteemable thing I could do was watching myself shift and change for real and then holding on to those changes and then watching those take root and flourish around me and people started thriving around me. And um, I just deeply trust uh, who comes through my my path and my and my business and where I get you know moved around on the board and this isn't a passive thing I'm showing up I'm taking classes I'm putting things out there you know I, I'm engaged it's there's nothing passive about it being uh, surrender the path of surrender is I don't know of anything more active than spiritual surrender because ego and the self-will wants to always get back in there and manage and control things. I'm a recovering codependent. And so I think we all are. We're just primed, right? We're we just are. primed to love in that kind of twisted way. If you don't love me, you might leave me. If I, you don't do this, then I'm not okay. Like we, we just, the pump's been primed for all, for most of us. So unlearning that. And, um, and I brought that actually to my relationship with God to be honest, you know, people pleasing. And if I do this, then you'll give me this. If, um, you know, it's, there's no spiritual math like that, um, but it's really, there's different stages. And so they're all important and they're all valuable. So tell me a little bit about your beliefs around attachment. Um, re, you know, the, the Buddhist philosophies, the Vedic philosophies around, you know, letting go of our attachments. And I'm sure that especially now that you're telling, telling me about your philosophy around surrendering and, and letting God take over, that for me, um, it still is a little bit hard to grasp. Like we, you know, we like to hold on to things. We like to hold on. These are my kids. <laughs> These, this is my business. And if I let go, imagine if I let go, you know, I would not have the finger on the pulse with this, or I would not know who's coming in and maybe scribbling over my work. <laughs> How do you let go in your mind of this sense of attachment? I think it's a dance. I think we lean in and we lean out. And that's to live. When you looked at the gesture of that, it's a dance and that's what we're doing. And so when we're conscious, it becomes really fun. And when we're not, it becomes painful. Um, mm. So I think it's, it's, we're going to, we, we're here. It's the, we're not, I don't think we're, you know, this is the path of the householder. We're not living in caves. We're not living under, you know, the Bodhi tree. And so it, it's a beautiful um, way to live. And I think we can just keep noticing, oh, I really want this. And just watch how we speak to ourselves. Watch, why do I want this? Why is this important to me? And get curious. I think when we have that dialogue, that conversation running as a current underneath things, um, we really draw closer to ourselves and those masks that you talk about, 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 oh, I'm doing this because someone else wants me to do this. Or we it's just keep asking those questions and you'll get to the nut of why you're doing it and why it matters. And then from there, there'll be less friction around, you know, people trying to get us to do these things or friction around um, having to have it done a certain way. We get more flexible. Mm. I don't have to actually have it this way. Why, you know, so, so I think that that's where we can start unknotting the, the knot of um, attachment. Mm. 
And is that how you ended up on a farm? Tell us a little bit about this move to to want to like continue with your passions and and really get into the dirt and start planting and working on your farm and having to let go of that life of I guess the people pleasing and the Hollywood and the mask wearing and just letting go of that and really focusing on on your passions. I was working that there's so much good work to be done in those places. I really want anyone who's listening to know you don't you can experience absolute peace and tranquility in the midst of chaos and in the people, places and things. In fact, those are the places where it's most needed for you to keep anchoring into yourself. So you don't have to run off to a farm, although so many people have been doing that, which is wonderful and beautiful. They're finding their place as a result of what's happened over the last few years. Um, and so that's beautiful. But I was already doing that work there and I felt this nudge that it was time. What if I wasn't working so hard to shut out the noise? What would it be like if I woke up and it was quiet around me? And here's the funny thing is that when I moved here, it was really, I realized it was quiet around me because I was in nature and I wasn't ever used to that. I'd always been a city girl. Um, but there was a lot of noise going on inside much more than I knew. And so I had to wrestle with that and not having places to go and girlfriends to meet up with and all these things that are so beautiful and so wonderful. And it was, I had a season for that, but it was a season for something else. And um, it's knowing what season you're in. And there's no prescriptive thing of the right way or this way or a farm or a city. It's really just being led from inside out and curating that voice and putting value on that voice within you sovereignty. That's really the biggest thing. This period of time has been about learning and unlearning. Where are you turning your power over? Where are you just, um, what authorities are you allowing to dictate what is in your life? In what areas of your life? Is it your parents? Are you still, even if they've passed, are you still taking notes from how they want you to be living? Is it your partner? Is it your government? Like what is, get real about what's important to you, what your values are, and then line your life up around that. On, behind that wow. this is this might sound um, a little bit shocking but I remember a spiritual teacher once told me to start living my life as if my parents had mm -hmm. died and I remember thinking wow you know that's that's a big hole you know but it actually really resonated for me because there are so many things we do not just for our parents but for our society and for how it looks to the outside world and what would my mom say if I did this or what would my dad say if I did this? So many our, so much of our internal dialogue is, is really based upon these belief systems from our past. Um, so it's beautiful that you teach to quiet the mind in this way. Um, I'm curious as well in your uh, life coaching business and how you client, work with your clients, what type of tools do you um, help them with in regards to finding that purpose and that inner peace? I have spent so long gathering as many tools as I can to self-regulate, to be able to come back home to myself. You know, you mentioned that, and that's been and knowing that like that dance and I'm going to get pulled off. I might, life might pull me off over here. I think something might get chaotic or dramatic over here that I can't control. But what I can manage is my reaction to it, my response to it, and also like how it settles within my system. And so when clients come through, I teach them at our, you know, an arsenal of tools, tons of tools, I, you know, emotional freedom technique, self-hypnosis, breath work, sound. I have all these tools. I have them go get, learn how to, you know, muscle test so that you can come back to your own answers. Um, when in doubt, because we have, you know, a higher self, we have a part of us that is so wise. And how do we connect with that part of us? And we have the inner child, everyone knows the inner child, everyone puts so much value on the inner child. And she's amazing. And connecting with her is powerful, because a lot of times, she's running point in our life, she's usually having a tantrum, she's afraid someone's going to leave her, you know. Um, and so she has her place. But when she doesn't, she doesn't know her place. So getting to know her and reassuring her and loving her and knowing her voice in your life is important, but it's equally more important you know, speaking to your higher self and finding out you know, the version of you that is on the other side, that knows everything, that is guiding and directing your life that wants to. Um, so that, that both of those inner child and higher self become a big part of how I work with clients also and knowing which voice is which 
connecting to that. And, um, you know, that's really, I, I, I might give books and I, we do meditations and there's just so many things I want people to not keep coming back to me for that. It's just go back out. Here's everything you need and then keep building on that. Mm, that's beautiful, Ryan. Yeah. That's so beautiful. I'm sure that you're helping so many countless people. Um, in my personal work as well, I do holistic health coaching and um, business coaching. And I find a lot of people right now, um, the amount of stress, the amount of pressure that we're under, especially us women um, around this age of the 40 and 50 mark are finding it very hard to cope. And I'm actually hearing the words come up a lot with my clients. I want to give it up. I want to give up everything. I want to just go and hide. I just want, there's, it's all too much. And there's a lot of incidents of depression and anxiety and not being able to cope with the pressures of the day to day. And I guess it also has to do with the fact that we have access 24 seven to this device in our pocket that doesn't stop either ringing, buzzing, or showing us things that we need to do or not do. It's, so overwhelming. So I'm actually having a lot of hard times feeling into these women, um, not personally having a hard time, but I actually have a hard time giving advice. What would you be able to advise on on women that are coming with these problems? And just, I'm sure it's not just in my, in my environment, I'm sure it's also in yours. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I, I would always say to curate your feed if it's social media you know, be ruthless about who you allow in your space on your phone and that scrolling that we go, that we all do. Make sure that if it's, you can mute people now. Did you know that? It's incredible. They won't know that you've, you know, that you're not following them anymore. So if you're a people pleaser, you don't have to unfollow them. You can just mute them and then they won't be coming up on your feed. Um, so that's for the half measures. We're all, you know, we have varying relationships with different people and we don't want drama. So whatever, what I'm saying is that you have absolute responsibility of what you, how you spend your time, who you spend your time with. You know, we are constantly in going into states of trance. We're being programmed all the time, whether we like it or not. It's what you watch. It's what you listen to. It's who you spend time with. It's what, you know, and so my feed is all spiritual. I learned so much on my Instagram. Like it's just a barrage of beautiful, you know, spiritual information and cultural information, things that inspire me. And, but even then I have to set boundaries with it. We all do because, you know, it can, it just grabs at us. So set great boundaries. You can set reminders on your Instagram. A lot of times I'll keep scrolling. I'll just swipe up, but every other time I don't. And I'm like, that's enough, you know? And, and so I go through again, different phases, different relationships with Instagram myself where I'm in, I just won't post for a while and I don't feel any obligation to show up and have to keep posting or do that. I mean, everyone's got their strategies. I just want to be heart led through it. And I just trust whoever's going to show up does. And if people leave, they leave and that's going to be okay too, you know? So it's, um, yeah, I guess it, the surrender has to show up everywhere, but, and I feel for your clients, that's, I always feel that if we feel overwhelmed, um, it's always a spiritual solution, always. It's always somehow there's not faith. I mean, I know this sounds simplistic, but every time in my life where I've hit the wall, I just have to enlarge my spiritual life. It might mean a little bit more discipline and discipline sounds so uh, around spirituality, but make it juicy, make it yummy, make it fun. Look forward to it. What do you need? Do you need to shake up your practice? Is there breath, sound, is there some way that you can show up for yourself? Because that's that's what you're looking for. It's not your business. It's not your relationship. And every time we start taking care of ourselves in that way, if I can point people back to that, it doesn't have to be spiritual, but it. how are you truly not like bath time? And those are people, I don't know why self-care gets under that bucket and it's all meditation and, and walks and it's different. There's a it's different quiet silence going inside into that theta state, that place beyond thoughts, space between thoughts. That is a place where we can deeply be restored and we can shift the programming up. That's why I'm a hypnotherapist because it's worked for me. And I found that, you know, 18 years ago. And I was tr treated, you know, with a hypnotherapist and I watched my life change. And so I knew one day I would fold that into my 
practice. And so I, that's how I work in my coaching is someone will show up and I can hear that programming under the surface of it. And I can only get to so much in the coaching, you know, do you really want to change? We have to go to the root of this belief system, the root of the programming and the not enough. It's always not enough. I'm not enough. It's not enough. It's always a lack, always, always. So I would say, start speaking to yourself and saying, I am enough. If there's any one mantra, there's one phrase, one affirmation, and affirmations usually don't work because we're doing them in this output state of beta, which is we wake up, we're brushing our teeth, I'm enough, I'm great. And guess what? The subconscious is like, no, no, not buying it. So put yourself in a state of trance, which is like I said, we do this all day long, in and out of trance, all day long. It's a very natural state. Do it with a couple of deep breaths. Just still the, still the, still the body. Take deep breaths. Just get that, that air in there. And from that place, repeat over and over. I am enough. There is enough. Everything I want is on its way to me. I can't wait to see what's next. Those sorts of phrases is what we want other people to say to us. Say them to yourself. No one's coming. They're not going to do it. They're not going to say it just right. So start saying those things. And you can also say them when you're going to sleep at night. As you're drifting off to sleep, you're going through these states before you hit delta, which is sleep. Very important states of um, brainwave activity. And as you're falling asleep, repeat those phrases. I can't wait to see what happens tomorrow. My life is so beautiful. Beautiful things are on their way to me every day. And that's watch your life change. Mm, I love that. It's such a beautiful mantra. I'm going to post it on my bathroom wall. <laughs> and also, you're right. It doesn't really matter if you say it during the day. If that last couple of you know, those nice, beautiful minutes before we fall asleep. Could you tell us a little bit more about breath work and theta and mm -hmm. being in this state of receiving for the mind? Because breath work is actually a very powerful tool to remove limiting beliefs and going deeper into our traumas and why we're actually showing up this way. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. your thoughts. Oh, yeah. Breath work is just so powerful. I'm getting my certification at this time to to become a breath worker because I use it in my practice. I'm a meditation teacher. And so I'm always, even in hypnosis, I'm putting people into that theta state. And so I, we always start with breath, even in self-hypnosis is a lot of breath. So um, to take someone for an hour, just using a certain breath work pattern, which is very simple. You know, the, the school, the place that I'm learning from is a very simple, very easy. I want it soft and gentle. They're much, much more vigorous and everyone will find their breath work that works best for them. But something simple and soft and gentle feels good to me. And when I'm doing that breath work, you know, we have, we're breathing every day. So there's nothing you need to buy. There's nothing you need to get. It's just becoming aware of our breath and the power of it. I think we breathe only 10%, five for 10% of our, of oxygen. And so when we breathe in a um, conscious way through breathwork patterning, we bring in like 70% more oxygen and that gets rid of viruses, bacteria in the body, stuck emotions, old patterns. And so every time I've done breathwork, I've had an absolutely different experience. You know, I've had, you know, fingers clenching up. I've had um, heart opening experiences. It's just the body letting go of stress. And I think oxygen is so intelligent. It knows exactly where to go, exactly what to do. So learn a simple breathwork pattern and set your timer 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes. And that's another tool, a beautiful tool. And you talked about theta. When we are children, we are in the state of theta, brainwave activity. It's slower. It's more about input from the ages of zero to seven. So everything we pick up in life around security, abundance, love, all our definitions, all our tapes, everything we, we pick up from that stage from zero to seven. So it's very fertile. And then after seven, we start going through these other brainwave, brainwave patterns. There's alpha and beta, which is more output. Alpha is kind of in between. So if you have a really great medita meditation, then you are most likely in alpha space between thoughts. It's slower brainwave pattern. Theta is where you can upload new ideas into the subconscious. And of course, everyone knows, like we said, Delta is sleep. So that's below that. So putting yourself into theta, 
through very um, relaxed breath. That's why breath work is so powerful. You're going into that theta state. And when you're working with a practitioner, they are um, basically, you know, doing subconscious programming to you, telling you how, um, how loved you are, how safe you are, how protected. And so all of that is going into that theta state and you're putting yourself into it. So it's very, very similar to hypnosis. Um, you're being guided by a practitioner, a facilitator into mm. this fertile space where things can be reorganized for your highest good. Beautifully said. Yeah, I, um, I did my breathwork certification as well, and I really enjoyed learning. I mean, the, the amount of information that stems back to the, mm. the Vedic in ancient cultures of pranayama and breath work that has been used throughout, you know, healing for in healings and modalities for centuries. Um, I really loved to see that bring, being brought back in and woven back in through the practice of breath work. And because sometimes, I mean, let's be honest, you go to a yoga class and it's really about asanas. It's really about the standing poses. Mm -hmm. And then only the last bit, sometimes, you know, you don't even focus too much on the meditation part, but really yoga is about the meditation. It's about the breath work. It's about the being able to slow our bodies down and being able to be able to calm our mind. So I feel like the modern day yoga has really cut that out a lot, which is nice to see that mm. the breathwork practitioners are now bringing that back together. So really to see, create more of a holistic view. Yeah. And what I found during my first breathwork, oh, I was a mess, by the way, like hands into like, you know, whatever your know, contortions you could possibly yes. imagine. But what came up for me is that I was mostly unsafe my whole life, my whole growing up life. And until I was about 18, I felt like I was in a state of fight and flight. And when mm -hmm. you've put yourself through that, and I guess imagine all of the, the amount of work that would put on our adrenals. And I actually realized that my biggest mantra is to make myself feel safe and to be able to speak mm -hmm. to myself and my inner child to say that I'm safe. And what you mentioned there as well, it is such a beautiful practice um, to be able to go into a theta. And I actually have my personal meditations that I've created for myself that I do to do self-hypnosis on myself. Crazy. But yeah, there's certain, no, it's fabulous. there are certain people that really need this more than others. And it wasn't through if it wasn't through breath work, I probably wouldn't have found that out. And I would have continued living my life by, you know, getting triggered by certain things or not realizing why certain interactions or relationships weren't working out and why I was getting furious or angry. And so a lot of times, if it wasn't for these type of beautiful medallas that you're, you're um, experiencing here from breath work to um, either EFT or working with a hypnotherapist or getting deeper into our subconscious, sometimes we as humans, we can't actually figure them out ourselves. So it's a beautiful practice to be able to offer this to clients and to be able to work with a practitioner, to be able to bring this out in ourselves so that we yes. can then do the work, the healing work that is then associated with the integration and bringing us back into a state of what, you know, I guess for me was um, balance to be able to have these mantras, to be able to go back to and come back to self and come back to feeling safe in my body. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would yeah. love for you if you can speak a little bit more about your work as a, as a um, hypnotherapist and what that can do for people. Well, hypnosis is similar. We're just guiding, guiding someone into that theta state, that magic state where things can actually get reorganized. You know, we find a lot of people come to me where they're very high achieving, they're um, spiritual, they've been on the path for a while. And they have their conscious mind, which wants things to be a certain way and not get triggered and be equanimous and to be even keeled and to be, you know, lean into their spiritual tenets or, you know, be commanding in the boardroom, whatever, whatever that is. And they're not able to, and they don't understand. So it's a disconnect. And that's where we see that conscious mind has, you know, different ideas of what it wants for us. And then the subconscious goes off of the programming that's familiar that keeps us in our comfort zone, that reroutes us back to what it knows, that it picked up usually from the ages of zero to seven, you know, obviously the other events that can happen. And it's really just trying to keep us safe. It's so dear. You know, it's like the inner child is just always trying to like, it has its own agenda. And it's this one, 
is really when, and once you understand it, just like the inner child, then she's not going to be unruly anymore because you're loving her. You're paying attention to her. It's the same with the subconscious. You start to know, oh, this is the programming. So you mentioned triggered when you, next time you notice that you're triggered, find out what's, what are you saying? That's take a journal out and start writing down what comes up when you're triggered. What's that? You'll, you'll find very quickly, you'll get your own mantras right there. You'll see what you're working off of. You're like, nobody loves me. There's not enough. And then take those and flip those into your own um, affirmations right there. You have a key into yourself and what you're working off of. And that's the saboteur, right? It's the subconscious constantly trying to bring you what it knows, like it's playing fetch, like the great Labrador. And just, there's a bone, it brings it back. But that doesn't work if you want something new, if you want a beautiful, empowered, loving relationship, but you're used to the bad boy because that's what the subconscious is familiar with. And that's what you're going to keep pulling in over and over and over. It's deeply frustrating. So that's where I find clients come in at that point. And so we just close that gap. I send, they send, they get sent off with their tools for living. And then, you know, they're, they're, they have this relationship with themselves where they're noticing who's in play. Is it the ego? Is it the subconscious? Is it the inner child? Is it the shadow who wants to wear the mask? So no one knows that we disown. And so I think we're just so, ex we're such an, an incredible mechanism for healing. Our body wants to heal. Our subconscious wants it. So it brings it over and over again. Do you see this? You see this? See, it's still here. How do you feel about it now? And so it's um, it's shining light on the places where we're not, um, where there might be a disconnect, you know? So it's really, it's an ally. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I feel like we're getting to the nitty gritty of, of really what it's about. I mean, we as Food Matters audience, we've always said food is better medicine than drugs and you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. However, when we you know, once we start, food is sometimes the way in, right? Once we start cleaning up our bodies and we start living a purer and cleaner life, we start realizing, wow, once we start cleaning up our bodies, there's also some cleaning to do in the mind, you know, and to be able to sweep clean the mind like you're doing with these, these traditional practices is so powerful. In regards to people that are currently a little bit on the fence in regards to, like you were saying, this is sounding a little bit woo-woo and this is sounding a little bit too like far-fetched and I don't know if I want my arms to go like that, you know, is there something that you can recommend um, for us to start with, you know, something to be able to, you know, start this journey into the self, something that we can just slowly start to ease into it with? Start a little morning practice, you know, get your journal, get a couple of cards, make, make a little sacred space for yourself, um, light a candle and just journal and see what's going on in your, in your heart. We're so disconnected and we have, you know, 30 to 60,000 thoughts a day and we can't stay on top of all of them. But when we sit and write, it's a really great way to start and then close the journal, take some deep breaths, set a timer for a couple minutes. These are for the ones that are, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Just set the timer for five minutes and just breathe in and out or listen to um, some lovely music. On my website, I have a couple of hypnosis um, tracks you can get. I've, you know, if you want to try that and go into a deep state of theta and see what that feels like. I mean, there's so many resources out there. Take a breath work class, go do a sound. You know, I find that sound I was just a programming director in this Upper East Side, uh, beautiful space called Sage and Sound. I did that for a year and a half. I was one of the founding uh, directors of programming for it. And so it was so beautiful to curate all these experiences for people, especially coming out of COVID. People wanted to come back together again. And we found that sound is where people were just, they were, they were just craving it, sitting with the sound of bowls, because you don't have to do anything. You just lay there. And that might be a place where you can get a little bit past the thoughts and you understand when you understand that you are more than your thoughts and you connect to that part of you and someone can guide you through that. So simple. Um, that, that feels, you know, we're all talking about spirituality and the soul and inner child, but when you touch into that, you can feel your, the infiniteness of who you are. You'll get a glimpse into it. You'll get a, a little tiny touch of it. And then you start to know that you are not the thoughts. You are not the think you're the thinker you're not the thoughts who is that person what's underneath there and start to get curious about that i've talked about curiosity so um you are your own best ally and if that's not true 
then find ways to start speaking kindly. Start looking for the good that you're already doing. You don't have to be more than you are. I mean, this is the problem with the new age world. A lot of times it's like the seeking, keep going. It's over there. Just take another workshop and do another thing and do, don't. How about not? How about just do a simple breath practice? Sit for five minutes, listen to some bowls, you know, go outside, lay in the grass, you know, like, I don't know, find what fills you up because there really isn't a whole lot else out there. And if you're doing it and you don't feel connected to what you're doing, then just pull it back in. I have that. That's happened to me. I put so much out and I had to like, just stop and know like I was on empty. So even for those of us that have been doing this for a while, I pull, you pull back in and I'm not giving it away until I have what I need to be able to give it, to give back for myself. That's just, I can't, you can't give away what you don't have, you know? So I stopped, I'll stop all clients. I'll, it's just, I'm, I want to always be in integrity with what I'm teaching and I have to be excited and feel passion and purpose around it. And if I don't, then I'll take more classes. Then I'll, you know, um, take time off. That's our absolute responsibility as wellness practitioners, you know, I don't know if I won't, but you know, in that wellness space. Yeah. Yay. 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 Love it, Ryan. Thank you so much. <laughs> so much wisdom that you're sharing with us. And I'm, I'm getting so much peace out of this conversation as well. I'm hoping that our audience and our listeners are getting that as well. And if we would like to further um, our knowledge of your work and like to learn more about how you, what you do and a little bit more about your meditations, could you tell us a little bit how to find that? Come over to Instagram. It's where I write the most. That's how you found me, right? Um, I, I do tend to write quite a bit there. Um, I'm at ryan.hadden. And then my website it sort of has my other offerings. So ryanhadden.com. Beautiful. Yes. I love all your meditations. They're very beautiful. Aww, thank you. Thank you Okay, so well, we're just coming to a close now for this beautiful podcast. And um, again, thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait to give you a real big hug in real life oh, one day I when I get to meet you. I'm sure that our paths will cross one day. I really hope that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And thank you for inviting me on. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ryan. So yes, thank you everyone for listening. I really enjoyed that talk. I hope you did too. And there will be more of these on the Food Matters podcast. So head to foodmatters.com and see you again.